the whole uh, passage this morning uh, from Joshua chapter 24, actually the last, uh, maybe maybe not completely the last word, well, the last recorded words that we have of Joshua and what he gives uh, is he will shortly uh, uh, leave this world after uh, this particular uh, speech that he gives unto the children of Israel. And he had gathered them together. And in Joshua chapter 24, beginning in verse 14, and he says, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve you the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he is it is that brought us up out of brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way wherein we went, and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will return, will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves, that ye have chosen, ye have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and took a great stone and set it there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, the stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, every man unto his inheritance. Let us pray this morning and ask God to bless his word. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the day and for what you've given to us. And Father, thankful for a time we can gather in your house. And Lord, as we've uh, fellowshiped in song and Lord, uh, sing praise unto you. We're thankful for the, the truth recorded within those. And Father, uh, just the, what you have done for us. And Lord, as we uh, come to the time of the preaching, I ask that you might bless your word. I pray that you'll uh, just help me to preach this morning, Father, that you'll fill me with the power of your spirit. Help me to communicate clearly those things you've laid upon my heart. And Father, may it be an encouragement to each and every one that's here this morning. Bless in the class in the back. And again, we just give you all the praise for all that you do, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, as we uh, made reference to the church being uh, the 141st anniversary of the church, started in the uh, old Elmore Schoolhouse. It was started by uh, a vision, a missionary vision from the uh, the campground church. You can find over there, uh, I guess that's the Muddy Pond Road that goes around there. The uh, church is, uh, that church is still in existence. And uh, this church was founded in 1879. And uh, when you look at that and you think of the time frame, the church has seen a lot of, a lot of changes in this world, even as I just mentioned some of the creature comforts. Uh, but it went through a number of the events of this country, as you would say. And any person who's lived for a long time, we can look and we can uh, sort of gather from, they've just seen a lot. And they've seen a lot of things that have come uh, up. And I mean, they've seen different things happen and changes. And when you talk to those people, it's sort of fascinating to uh, hear how things were and then how they are now. And we're thankful that, again, those in the past, they deemed it important that the church stay, that they kept the doors open, that they uh, kept a place to serve the Lord, that they tried to reach the community. We're thankful for that. You know, the congregation, uh, we know in years, uh, and even in, in my years, uh, it's went up and down in size. Uh, um, I don't think I've had problems necessarily within. I'm thankful for that uh, in uh, things without. Uh, but when you look back and we know some of the history of the church and what I was told and some of those things, sometimes it had problems within. 
uh, sometimes problems and things on the outside. It endured those things. We're thankful for that. And uh, we pray we, uh, we avoid those things. All churches do. But uh, I want to give you some thoughts on some things that the, the events, and uh, again, it's not a, uh, an inclusive list. It's just my list that I put together. Some things that the church would have lived through. And, uh, and again, it's not a complete list, but just some of the events that took place in this world that would have had to have been a part of not only their lives, but their prayers and their actions. You know, this morning we made some prayer requests just for various things, but some of them obviously included the events going on. In times past and uh, even the last year, last two or three years, uh, uh, just in my time here, anything that's happened in our country that was significant, we prayed about that, didn't we? We had a lot of those things and it affected our people. It affected you in your life because you lived through that. And as uh, you get to thinking and probably have even seen uh, some people who did probably shared some memes about different people when they were born and what they were born into and maybe the lives they lived and those kind of things that they, that they might have done. Again, uh, you know, you think of a church that's existed all these years and what it would have uh, lived through. When it was uh, started in 1879, of course, this part of the country, very farm-like, very sparse. As a matter of fact, I think that's why we've got so many little churches dotting the area. People just didn't travel that uh, far in the day. Nowadays, we don't think nothing about it. If we want to drive, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes to go somewhere, uh, it's not near as big of a deal as it was uh, back in the day. And so I think you had a lot of little, what we would call country churches, and they were started in areas uh, again, trying to help a community, trying to meet the need of that community. Because again, uh, travel was uh, a little more uh, uh, limited maybe at that time. And it was. But then you start looking at just again, the national events. And, and of course, our country uh, not too far removed from uh, the Civil War and those things. I mean, several years beyond that, the church would have started. But again, our country for those last years of the, of the 1800s uh, had a lot of, uh, uh, again, uh, just a problems, uh, unrest, those kind of things, the settling of our country. And you look at some of those events, and even when you pull up a list of historical events, uh, those kind of things, uh, you don't see as many maybe of the big events. But uh, And even the, the first one I'll mention, it may not have been a big thing because it wasn't as big of a conflict maybe for us, but the Spanish-American War would take place in 1898. And I uh, don't know if uh, uh, maybe necessarily a number of people from here maybe were involved, but you never know, the church may have prayed over that. It would have made news. But probably one of the biggest things they would have encountered, at least, uh, and they would have already been established a number of years at this time, but World War I. And we obviously know we had a great impact with that. Uh, one of the uh, most decorated uh, lived just up the road. And, uh, this area would be familiar with that. And you think about maybe the time in which the people of that would have lived and maybe the, the prayer requests and the things that would have come in. And uh, the church survived, uh, and a lot of people probably had questions. And what's uh, even interesting, on the heels of that, you find an event that took place that was worldwide that much uh, represents the time in which we sort of think we're in now, or we see that, and uh, that is of the Spanish flu. And anything you read about that, uh, it was quite, a, quite an event. Matter of fact, uh, one thing I read said it infected a third of the world, they feel a third of the world. Uh, it killed some 675,000 in the U.S. alone. And uh, that's probably maybe not even with good records and good estimates, but that's what they feel. Uh, what, a, what an event that was, a pandemic. And matter of fact, it's called the Spanish flu. If you read about it, it may not even, we may have named it after them. It may not have started there. It could have even started in Kansas, I think I read one thing about it. Uh, so, uh, and uh, probably spread by some of the soldiers coming home. And again, a lot of the things that they did there, some of the same things we're doing in our present situation and those kind of things. But, you know, the church would have endured that. Would they have, uh, would they have closed for a time? That I uh, don't think we have any record on. Uh, some churches did. I uh, tried to look some of that up to see what the uh, actions of the day were. Uh, some of them, again, uh, they wore masks and did different things at a time. And they still probably didn't have, again, the population or even the social events and world that, again, we live in today. But those things would have affected the church and it would have affected, uh, again, the, the decisions maybe being made, the people that were there, what they did in their lives. You even think beyond that, what about the time of the, the Great Depression? And uh, 1929 is when the stock market would crash through the early 30s. What a horrible time that was in our country. 
the value of things, jobs and just uh, society and all that was uh, going on there. The country was in a, a, a sad state of affairs. And we look and we say, well, we've, we've come through events like similar to that in our time. Uh, maybe we're just uh, the stock market took a big bad turn. A business took a bad turn. Several years of a bad economy, we might say. I don't think it, from all the you read about it, I mean, obviously we weren't there, uh, but it pales in comparison to what took place during that time. And again, the, the, the motivation of people, maybe the mindset of people, and again, even just the, the struggle they would go through because things just weren't there in life. And uh, again, they survived. And matter of fact, we're thankful that they chose to keep church doors open during that time. And those folks probably prayed, probably prayed for our country, probably prayed for their families and for people during that time, for jobs, for uh, food, for the things that were needed. And again, a very tough time for our country. And on the heels of that, not too far removed from those time errors, uh, our country would go to war again. And they would deal, uh, many of them, with the shock of uh, us being attacked at Pearl Harbor in 1941 and the war that would follow there for uh, the, the following years till 45. And they would see that war and see the world plunged into war and uh, a little bigger and more on a wider scale, our part at least, uh, there may be the first world war and what would take place there. And we know that, again, that took people from this area. We know that they were involved. Uh, we know that even locally we had a, uh, you know, a prison camp out here and uh, uh, some of those things. I mean, you know, again, you think of the atmosphere that would have been around. The church would have discussed that, would have prayed about that. Preacher might have even preached some uh, topics on that. I can't believe that somebody probably didn't uh, uh, preach about some of those dictators being the Antichrist. Uh, you know, some of those things are at least like him. Uh, those things probably affected and they probably uh, did uh, uh, to the church and caused it uh, what it did in its decisions or at least the direction of the hearts of the people and how they prayed and what they did. And we've seen, of course, the end of that war with atomic weapons that were made and produced and at least in some form, uh, the technology for that not too far from where we live and uh, in our own state. And so you see all of that come. But again, the church stayed still. It survived through all that. The Korean War of 50 to 53, the assassination of President Kennedy. I think what a national event that was. People remember where they were. They know exactly uh, those people that lived through that. They remember those days. Uh, again, it took in their life. The Vietnam uh, War from 65, so a very long war, and people involved and sent in. As a matter of fact, that's where we start seeing our country erode a little bit in patriotism and just the national things and so many other events you could put into that. Uh, again, the, the Middle East conflicts that uh, I can at least say I lived through some of that in the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, because I know it affected, again, churches. It, it caused us to pray. It caused us to think about those who uh, had to go off to, to fight and to do that. And uh, even those things, that what they might do and what would take place. And of course, uh, most of, uh, a lot of us, uh, the attacks on 9-11 and uh, in 2001 and uh, our, uh, the other terrorist acts that we've seen come about in more of the present age. And you can think about it. We had prayer in churches. We talked about some of those things. Uh, when they would take place in our country, we would pray for those people. I even thought about it because in our uh, day and age, the school and the public shootings and all that's become a little more uh, newsworthy in the day in which we live. And it started with a, uh, a school shooting in Colorado in 1999, or it seemed like that was one that, uh, that made the, the news so big and then went on from there. And uh, we've, we've had several of those events that have took place. And we've come in uh, the next Sunday, we've asked for prayer for those people, for our country, and we've prayed for it. And so even you can see how the events of a nation, even again, dealt with the people of the church, even today. And then, of course, where we are today, dealing in this pandemic with the COVID-19 and the scare of that. And again, people not sure what to believe, not sure how bad it is. A lot of mixed information maybe out there, maybe mixed views of what people take. Uh, but again, our country reacts and it does affect people. We all probably know somebody either who's had it or uh, had trouble with it. Uh, it's obviously affected a lot of things, economy, jobs, and uh, just lives in general. It's something we pray about. It's something we consider. And again, it touches the church. But as with these other things, we hope the church will stand true and stand through it. And other things that you could say, various storms, fires, national tragedies. I mean, I highlighted a few events from 
history that the church would have seen and that the church would have again stood through all that. And again, not an inclusive list, but just a list I made. But you think of the different things that have even come recently, and we've prayed for those people, people in other parts of our country, people that were affected uh, through loss and storms and floods and fires, all of that. But all of these kind of things come together, and yet the church stood still, and the church stayed and remained where it was, and we're thankful for that. You know, I read you about a man in the Bible, uh, Joshua, and Joshua was one of those great uh, characters, one of those great people of the Bible. And at the close of his life, he comes and he dresses the nation of Israel. And he says, and the verse that, again, a lot of people have heard and you may know and you memorize, uh, a lot of people probably have memorized. And verse 15, it says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, and hopefully nobody uh, seems evil in the, to serve the Lord, but he's very, uh, very uh, pointed when he talks to the children of Israel. He said, choose you this day whom you will serve. And he mentions the fact that they could have served the gods of their fathers uh, that were on the other side of the flood, the gods of the Amorites. That's the neighbors that they lived around. But he closes that and he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua in his older years stood up and he says, I'm going to do the same thing I've always done and I'm going to serve the Lord. And the one thing we can find about the character of Joshua in the Bible is you find a faithful man. Throughout everything that we know about him, he was there. He served the Lord. He's seen a lot. Again, as uh, we spoke of the church, he, uh, uh, the church that here we're speaking of this morning lived through a lot. Joshua, you could say, was a man who got to see a lot, and yet uh, he stood firm. He stood true. Uh, we don't see him uh, being bitter at times. We don't see him going away from the Lord. His nation did. His people did. But Joshua was one of those people who stood true. I want to give you a few events out of his life. And then I hope to close with something a little more even personal concerning us in the church that we'll see as we close out the sermon. But think of Joshua for a minute. And I won't take time to turn to all these places this morning. I'll give you some reference. But you actually first seen Joshua mentioned when Moses calls him up and he's called to get together a, a fighting force and they go out to do battle with Amalek. And you'll see that in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 9. And Joshua will become a man of war and he will lead a group and they will have victory there. And they'll go out and they'll fight. But you also see Joshua not too far from those events. And he'll be with Moses as he serves under him. And he comes as a minister of Moses. And Moses will take him when he goes up into Mount Sinai to see God actually receiving the, the Ten Commandments, as we say, the law in general. Uh, all the things that God will give him as Moses goes up into the mountain. Joshua will follow him halfway up and stay there. He was with Moses on Mount Sinai. And uh, what an amazing place that would have been. Of course, when Moses came down, if you'll remember, the children of Israel had had all kinds of chaos in the camp and they came down. And Joshua said, it's not a, it's the sound of music I hear. They were having a big party down there. Moses would cast those original tablets to the ground. You may remember and break those as the children of Israel uh, had fallen into great sin uh, without their leader. And as Moses was gone for a while and they uh, chose to do other things. But Joshua was with him and served as a faithful servant and a faithful man to Moses. And he was one of the 12 spies that would go into the promised land. And you may remember that it was Joshua and Caleb that would come back and they would say, it's a good land. We, we are to take this land. God's going to give it to us. And some would say, well, we're just as, as grasshoppers in their sight. And Joshua said, God will fight our battles. God's going to give us that. And Joshua had the outlook and Joshua said, you know, with the Lord, we can go do this. He's brought us out of Egypt. And Joshua had such faith. And him and Caleb had the faith that said, God can give us the promised land. But 10 of them said, no, no. It's a land that floweth with milk and honey. But there's too, too many of them. Too much that our God can't take that. Our God can't do that. And because of the 10, the crowd uh, joined with them. And because of that report and that bad report that came back, God would punish the children of Israel. For 40 years, that generation would be called to wander in the wilderness. And when you think about it, Joshua was right there with them. Joshua and Caleb would wander in the wilderness, if you will, with the children of Israel. We have those events recorded in the Old Testament. And we would have that, that wandering. They would actually be punished for the time that they looked out the land and then they chose to go against the decisions of God. But Joshua would be allowed to go into the promised land. Moses wouldn't even 
set foot in the promised land. He would see it from afar off. God would, uh, would not allow him to go in. And Joshua would eventually succeed Moses as the leader of the children of Israel. You see that in Numbers chapter 27. And Joshua was called up. He will uh, succeed him. And then uh, as we read through our Bible, and uh, especially in the book of Joshua, we see him taking that command. And we see Joshua rise up and he leads the people. They will cross the Jordan. God will part the waters and they'll defeat the walled city of Jericho. But again, not like the first time that he began to fight uh, for the cause of Christ. He didn't do it with a sword. He didn't do it with a spear. They marched around and God would drop the walls. They would then uh, take over with sword and spear. But uh, God would defeat Jericho in a great, uh, literally a great battle of faith because God said, this is the way I want to do it. And Joshua obeyed the Lord. He would continue on and he would lead the children of Israel and they would conquer the land. And that's where you have the, the speech that was given here. At the close of his days, Joshua would call his family. He would call Israel together. He would speak unto them. And Joshua would stand in his house and he would say, as I have always done, and I will do now, I choose to serve the Lord. And this day I choose to put evil away. And this day I'm making a choice. And I am going to serve the Lord as for me and my house. Joshua was quite a man when you look through his life. We don't find a lot of... Uh, Again, a lot of bad things said in the Bible about Joshua. I'm not saying he's perfect. None of us were, uh, are, were, and, uh, and don't exist. There's no perfect man other than the Lord Jesus Christ. But Joshua stayed faithful. And what we see recorded in Scripture about him, Joshua was a faithful servant to God. But you think about it, even for 40 years, he had to wonder till he received the promise that God gave him. And some would say, well, you know, even though he was right and he did right, he still had to, as we would say, suffer with the rest of them. But he did. He was called to do that as well. But you don't see him. Uh, again, you don't see his pity party somewhere else. You don't even see him joining the crowd. Joshua remained faithful even through the tough times and even through the wilderness wandering. He's an interesting character study in our Bible. But I thought of him because I thought of this phrase, or this passage in which he would speak. And again, a familiar uh, portion of Scripture, but he told us to choose. And we do. We have to wake up every day. And you and I have to choose what we're going to do for that day. And are we going to choose to, to serve the Lord? Or are we going to give in to the pressures of this life, the pressures of this world? We can join with the gods around us, if you will. We may not have nations as they had that had false gods and other gods. They're, they're here present in the world. Maybe they're not little idols today. Uh, per se, but there's a lot of things that take us away from the true God and from our service to God. And every day we have to make a choice and say, today I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to be faithful today. And hopefully we have uh, those and we stand up for our households and we say, as far as I'm concerned, for me and my house, the decisions I make, we're going to serve the Lord and we're going to do that. Joshua stood uh, as a man in his house and he stand and he stood for the cause of Christ and for, for the Lord and for those things. Uh, that he would have him, and he remained faithful. And so uh, when you look at uh, the things that I've pointed out today, and speaking of what the church maybe lived through, and some of the things, and the fact that we're still here, you look at Joshua and what he did, maybe what he went through. And again, we didn't completely cover the events of Joshua's life. I highlighted a few. When you read the Old Testament, you read about the children of Israel, remember that, that Joshua was right there with them. And it remained faithful through all their struggles, their trials, uh, their sin, if you will, and their, their punishment of the wilderness wanderings, but even the other events, uh, the unfaithfulness. And Joshua dealt with it, even the sin of Ai uh, and some of the things that after Jericho, he learned very much and seen some of his people die because of those sins or the sin of Achan, uh, said Ai, but uh, Achan who had tucked those things. And so uh, again, when you look at Joshua and what he did, uh, he remained faithful. And what I want to give you as I close this morning, and uh, take me just a minute, but as I give you the last part of my sermon, again, I guess I had it sort of broke down in three points today, but the last part of it is what helped these folks to stand? What made a difference? What was the mindset in someone like Joshua? That even though things changed in his life, that he stayed faithful. What was hopefully the mindset in the people of the church who came before us. Many who we didn't know, 
and uh, those who will come after us, us included, and those who will come after till the coming of the Lord. We pray that churches stay open, that they stand firm, and that they uh, uh, continue until uh, God calls us home. But what helped them to stand? I want to give you a few things this morning that I think uh, is true for any Christian that I think can be a, a blessing to us if we hold to these things and be reminded of the truth that's in God's Word. And first and foremost, God is still the same. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 tells us that Jesus Christ, uh, of course, that form of the Godhead there, uh, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is still the same. He's never changed. Whether we look back into uh, 1879 when they established uh, this organization to today when we stand and uh, we preach and proclaim God's Word, we serve the same God. And when Joshua would stand and he would say that he's chosen to serve the Lord and he stands for him in his house, he served the same God that we did. God is still the same. And we can hold to that. You know, the world changes. God stays the same. Secondly, God's word is still sure. Now, in Joshua's day, we have the recording of that, that we're given uh, the writing of the scriptures, uh, those things recorded. You and I have been blessed to have the preserved uh, and uh, completed canon of scripture that we hold in our hands. God's perfect word, we're able to have that. We have that today. God's word is still sure. Matter of fact, we're told in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25 that it will, uh, it will endure. And uh, I'll just flip over there to, uh, to read that reference to you. But uh, as we think of the Word of God, that's what we hold for faith and practice. That's what we look at for what is our guide and our uh, way that we want to live and what we want to learn and what we know about the Word, about the Lord, and about all things that concern our Christian faith. And Peter tells us in chapter 1 and verse 25, But the Word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the Word which by the Gospel is preached unto you. And so the Word's going to stand still and stand sure, and we're thankful for that. Thirdly, the gospel still saves. Aren't we thankful for that? That the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he said, this is what I believed in. And this is what I give you. And he speaks of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. You actually see that in the first four verses of 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter. He said, this is what I believed. And matter of fact, that's what we still preach today because that's the only message we have. That's the only message that will take a, a, a lost sinner and transform their life. And by the grace of God, uh, they can be changed and they can have a home in heaven no matter where they've been, what they've done. The gospel still saves. And it's based on what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, His death, His burial, and His resurrection. And we're thankful for that. The gospel still saves. And uh, this church hopefully has been preaching that gospel for all these years, and we hope it continues on, and that that's still the focus, and that that's what we look at. It's not by the things we can do, but it's what God has already done. Next, we think that grace is still available. And uh, again, on the same heels of that, because that verse told us that, uh, that it's the gospel that's preached unto us, and I had mentioned, and it truly is by the grace of God that we're saved, and God's grace is extended to all men. You know, the gospel's not... Uh, uh, sort of set aside for those uh, who are privileged or those who are of some uh, certain uh, creed or are just a different thing. And today we hear so much about that, so much division based on who people are. And we look at it, God created us all. We're all the, the same. We're all in the same world. And the gospel comes to all the world. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. We're thankful the grace is still available. It still is there. The gospel still saves. And uh, that's the message that we have. And it works. And it changes hearts and lives. And we're thankful for that. Sin can be forgiven. What a blessing that is. And then fifthly today, and uh, what I think when you look back through the history probably of a church and what it endured, and hopefully they realize that then. Hopefully we realize it now. Hopefully those that will come after us till the coming of the Lord realizes that prayer still works. James chapter 5 and verse 16 tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Prayer still works. We pray. We pray about a number of things. I'm thankful this past week I can begin to tell you of the prayer requests that we have made and just different things that people sometimes will ask us to pray for and God answers those. 
And I'm thankful that each week I can probably look back week after week and think God answers prayers from small to large, from uh, people that we feel that need a, a really a miracle in their life. God answers those to sometimes just needing something to take place in their life and something to happen and God to intervene. And maybe in a situation, maybe in a uh, just a dispute or something else, something that we've made a matter of prayer. I'm thankful that prayer still works and it has worked. It worked back in their day. It worked in the day of Joshua. Uh, it works in the day in which we live. It'll work tomorrow. Prayer still works. We hold on that. And those are things that I think help the church to still stand. I think that the church probably still stood because it had a focus on something greater than them that was still yet to come. No matter what would take place in the world, the next thing I wrote down, Jesus is still coming. We close out the scriptures in the in Revelation chapter 22. And the last uh, among the last words that are recorded in the Bible and uh, in verse 20, and he writes, he which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come. Lord Jesus. And some will say, well, uh, quickly he's not. The church has been around all that time. He still hadn't come. And we look at it sometimes and we say, I wish he'd come quickly. And uh, even though he may or may not come in our lifetime, we're not sure of those things. And in God's time frame, quickly is, uh, is a, whole different, uh, a whole different way than you and I look at it, put it that way. Remember, uh, uh, you know, our life, it's just a vapor that appears for a time is God's eyes. And so when you look at time, you got to think of it in God's time, but surely he comes and he comes quickly and Jesus is still coming. And you know, the church, I think back in the day, looked forward to it. You and I are to look forward to it. And the church tomorrow are to look forward to it. Jesus is still coming and the church still stands. You know, today we talk about those things that are essential, those things that are needed and a lot of discussion in our world among what those things are. I think the church is still one of those things. Ephesians chapter Three and verse 21 promises it to go on through the ages. But the church is here to help the lost, that we might be a, a light to them, to encourage the saint, to train those that serve, and again, to shine in a dark world. May you and I hold to the things that we know. May we uh, continue on for the cause of Christ. And may you and I uh, take our part in the church to take it into the future as God would have us to. And maybe with those in the past, like Joshua, Say, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Let us do what we can going forward. May God bless us as we carry on the work of the church in the days to come. Let us stand with our heads bowed this morning. And as we... Uh...